Wohlstand für alle. Spezial. Hello and welcome, Andrew Elrod. Hello. Ja, äh, wie man schon an der Anmoderation merkt, sprechen wir heute nicht auf Deutsch mit einem Interviewgast, sondern wir sprechen heute auf Englisch, da wir nämlich einen Gast haben, der uns aus den USA zugeschaltet ist, der kein Deutsch spricht, der uns sehr viel Interessantes zu berichten hat über die Geschichte der Preiskontrollen, über die er im vergangenen Jahr seine Dissertation abgelegt hat an der University of California und der heutzutage äh, für eine Gewerkschaft an der Westküste arbeitet. Wir sprechen mit Dr. Andrew Elrod. Andrew, I'm very glad to have you here with me today. The last time we talked, a few weeks ago, we were talking about wartime and about inflation and about price controls because I did an interview for Der Freitag, a German weekly. And now a few weeks later, we are experiencing a new war in Europe. And we are also seeing very serious discussions about price controls which is quite surprising because just a few months ago when Isabella Weber started this entire discussion about price controls, a lot of economists were ridiculizing her. Well, now they aren't anymore and I'm glad to have you here with me today. So um, we are going to have quite a lot of uh, subjects to cover today. Uh, we need to talk about the theory of price controls. Why are so many economists against it? We need to talk about the history of price controls and of course about the question Could price controls help in the economic crisis that might come together with this war, not only in Europe, but in the entire world? So maybe we should start, uh, start with the theoretical issues. A lot of economists are, or at least a lot of mainstream economists are, against price controls. Why is that? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, it's a big question. Um, I guess uh, you know, listeners should are, are probably familiar with um, the uh, idea that prices serve a kind of signaling mechanism for um, society. Um, they, uh, you know, they they are, they are the one of the primary determinants of, of profits, and um, and as profits vary across uh, industry lines of production, uh, uh, companies. Um, Entrepreneurs, uh, uh, so the theory goes, uh, have a um, uh, an indication about where social priorities lie, and and uh, uh, so so the notion that um, you know prices should remain uh, uh, pri privately controlled, I guess is, is the word I, I would use, um, not controlled by by the government uh, through any ceilings or floors. Um, not pegged by the government in any way or fixed by the government. That that idea, uh, you know, is is rooted in, in uh, really English, you know, ang Anglo assumptions um, about uh, uh, you know uh, the role of competition um, uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 private incentives. Um, so so the idea is that if uh, Uh, prices increase somewhere, you know, it indicates a, uh, an increase in demand for whatever that good is for, the, for those commodities, and that um, the uh, increase in, in prices and profits is, 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 uh, will, will encourage uh, competitive entrepreneurs uh, to enter that uh, line of business and um, supply <laughs> the demand that is driving the price up. Um, uh, and uh, uh, compete those profits away. So, so it just in in the in the world of theory, you know, there there it's a, there's a very strong case against um, controlling prices and uh, and and a very sound you know logical argument to make that it, if the government does uh, uh, fix certain prices and and prevent the uh, The increase in profits that accompany, uh, you know, an expansion of demand, uh, or an, or a change in the composition of demand, so you know, so so that certain industries are suddenly profiting much more. If the government prevents that from happening, then the entrepreneurs, you know, they won't know where to put their resources. In, in vet, the investors who are giving the, the loans to the entrepreneurs won't know, you know, who is actually uh, satisfying. Uh, you know the changing composition of of the of the society's you know 
demand for commodities. So, uh, so you know, the, the theory um, is, you know, it's 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 a price theory. Uh, it's it was formalized at the end of the nineteenth century. Um, uh, the English economist Alfred Marshall, I think, is is the one who first popularized the uh, you know the 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 graphical depiction of, of, of supply and demand schedules and you know the crossing of supply and demand at a, at a given price and quantity so uh, and that price theory has remained a kind of core um, uh, really canon to what we think of today as academic economics if there's one thing that you learn in a, in a school economics class economics textbooks you know it's going to be this sort of basic um, uh, uh, mode of of rep representing, you know, what is in fact a, a extremely complicated um, and uh, uh, not as competitive uh, as theory might um, indicate. Uh, uh, of a, you know, but an economic process that that you know is uh, extremely complicated and um, uh, varies by industry. Uh, you know, one tool and one, I guess, one reason for the success of the economics discipline uh, is that, you know, it, it, it gives people tools to, un to understand um, what, what is, uh, uh, you know, um, actually di uh, 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 highly complex and, and uh, historically specific uh, configurations of, you know, of production, distribution, consumption, and, and that, that sort of stuff. So, um, so that's the case against price control, and um, you know it's it's firm, and and the reaction to the uh, recent talk among some economists, journalists, and historians who recognize the fact that throughout the history of capitalism, governments have time and again resorted to to price control. The sort of scandalized reaction to that acknowledgement is one measure of the sort of the strength of that orthodox. Uh, price theory. Hmm. But of course, what strikes me, I mean, first of all, this entire theory, it makes a lot of sense. So when demand goes up, prices go up, this means that profits go up, which means that production will expand, expand. And then of course, uh, supply will meet demand again, and then prices will fall, etc. And if the state uh, doesn't respect these laws and sets a price which is too low, then production won't expand and then supply won't meet demand, etc. This all makes a perfect lot of sense. But I mean, this is not the situation we are experiencing right now because we cannot just uh, we can't just expand production anytime we, we want. We have global supply chain issues, we have energy issues. So this uh, model, which is making sense in a perf perfect competitive world, etc., is not what we have right now, right? There uh, are competitive industries. I guess I, I wouldn't say that you know every market is dominated by uh, a, you know a, a cabal or a conspiracy of, of um, um, oligopoly firms. Um, but it is true that uh, supply takes time to respond. Um, and uh, particularly if you are uh, relying on um, imported commodities that are outside of the national economy, then then uh, the the you know the time that it takes uh, could be very long. Um, there could be some uh, barriers to uh, you know, for example, political barriers to to uh, accessing an increased supply. Um, uh, and that could drive prices up for a very long time. There's, there was something similar. I mean, this is what happened in the petroleum industry, the global petroleum industry during the 1970s. The developing countries and the Organization uh, for Petroleum Exporting Countries, um, you know, a, a, basically a geopolitical fo formation, um, increased the global price of oil because they needed to import more dollar-denominated capital goods, machinery, you know, modernization equipment. Um, and, and the price of oil quadrupled in a year, you know. So, um, uh, and, and, and so in, in in those situations where where the um, a a market price increase is is unavoidable, uh, societies have other ways of 
rationing a, um, a fixed supply. You know, that's what prices do. The prices are, are a form of rationing, um, and they ration to the highest bidder. But if you, if you are in a situation where there's a certain commodity that the, that the, the public uh, determines that it needs, its members need, um, and that rationing it on, on the basis of price uh, is not going to be uh, acceptable, the public won't accept that, uh, you need to find some other, other ways to do it. And pr price control is, is a sort of initial step to prevent the price increase from happening and therefore ensure a um, access to, you know, to, to those on, on lower incomes who can't afford uh, the, the market price. Um, and then, depending on the duration of the um, of the you know <laughs> the experiment, um, usually this will pass uh, into uh, rationing. Or almost, I mean, almost immediately, you can imagine that if you're going to keep prices down, you're going to have to limit the the quantity that every individual, that each individual gets. And something like this is similarly happening, uh, at least in the United States, with like COVID tests, the uh, what the English call lateral flow tests. Uh, you know the the, the, the retailers, they'll only sell you four or they'll only sell you eight or something because they realize that there's a huge demand here. They're not going to just increase the price to, uh, uh, you know, $200 a test or whatever. Um, I think maybe in England, they, there is some more price competition. You do get these ridiculously priced tests. In the United States, uh, at least at the major national retailers that I've seen, you know, they've been keeping the price in the $20, $30 range, but they limit how many you can take. And there you can see privately the, 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 the retailers themselves are rationing. They're doing, you know, um, and, and that tells you a little bit about the, the relate, you know, the relationship of, uh, between price and quantity. You know, in, in theory, uh, if they were competitive sellers, they would just let the demand for COVID tests dictate a price and the price, the price would change every day. But uh, our, our markets are organized in a way to where prices really are um, fixed, by the by, the companies for periods of time, uh, 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 you know, January comes around, everybody adjusts their prices, and then, then we have that year's prices for a lot of markets. And uh, in that situation, um, you know, already from the get go, the, you, what you're observing is not a, a freely moving competitive market. Uh, um, so, um, you know, this this is you know the COVID test. This is one example, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know the. Uh, there are a wide variety of commodities, so maybe maybe if we could, um, I guess I could I should ask, you know, is this starting to get at a, an answer to your question? Yes, of course, and I mean, uh, I also have some examples. For example, in Germany, when this entire crisis started, um, the state didn't really think about rationalizing, etc. But the market did. I mean, when I went into Kaufland, so a uh, uh, supermarket here in Germany, a very famous one, uh, I couldn't buy as much butter as I wanted to. I mean, just as you said, they might have said, uh, we are just gonna, gonna sell butter at high prices and anybody who wants to buy it and has enough money to do so can do it. They didn't. They um, had the prices fixed and they said, okay, anybody who wants to buy butter, you can, but you can only take, I don't know, like uh, five pieces of butter or something. So this is pretty much what happened here. And uh, what we experienced in the 20th century, right, in Europe and in the United States is that it wasn't only markets who were um, trying to impose prices, but also the state. The state tried to impose price controls, for example, during wartime to keep inflation low, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the um, conceptual move that uh, many of the theorists of, uh, of price control uh, made in the early 20th century, uh, really the first half of the 20th century, um, uh, among whom you know, a writer like John Kenneth Galbraith, the American economist, is probably the, the, the most famous um, and successful. Um, you know, the conceptual move is, is to say, um, yes, we accept price theory. Uh, we understand, uh, you know, uh, the way uh, prices, quantities, profits should uh, operate, but we observe in our actual organized economy a uh, different behavior. And once you, if if you can make the, uh, if you can accept the uh, fact that um, private firms already exercise a degree of discretion over their prices, um, 
then uh, the case uh, against price control starts to, to weaken because you, you start to see that uh, 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 it's not, you know, market forces alone which are determining the, uh, you know, the, the, the availability and, and the terms of access to, to commodities, but, um, but sources of, of power, private power, and industries, um, people who control industries, um, uh, uh, almost uh, always some sort of, of pri the p private power based on, on, on private property, um, uh, and uh, that's you know that power can then become uh, subject to to the state to you know to to public uh, intervention through through the instrument of the state. Um, just to since we're talking about history, uh, one of the big arguments that emerged after World War II, really during 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 the war, but but. But it, it came to hold a, a very strong um, position in the uh, you know the rhetoric of of the Cold War that followed was that the uh, the nature of many of the states that had imposed price controls during the '40s uh, and 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 you know it really during the Depression um, those states were not democratic states they uh, they didn't represent any. Um, any form of public that you know, uh, uh, the, at least the the uh, group that called themselves the free countries during the Cold War that they would re uh, recognize, and so that argument that you know the state itself is kind of untrustworthy um, uh, became very um, influential uh, uh, among American writers at least, and so the example was you know it was like well who who controls prices? It's Stalin's Russia. It's uh, uh, you know Mussolini uh, in Italy. Uh, you know these are not uh, uh, democratic states, and therefore price control itself is you know the kind of power that can be abused by the totalitarian governments. Um, but you know that's that it was the Cold War. It, it's it's not true that only um, states without elections control prices. There are plenty of states that have elections that impose price controls. And, uh, and yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean the United States, France, for example, uh, Leon Blum in France. So, I mean, let's let's look at one of those uh, states. Maybe let's talk about the U.S. Uh, as, at first. Sure. I mean, you had price controls during the Second World War, during the Korean War, but was was it only an instrument used in wartime? Or well, even before the World War, um, even before World War One, uh, uh, in the United States, at the end of the nineteenth century, the problem of uh, the railroad corporations was a was a dominated national politics in a way that. Um, you know, today in the United States, people talk about healthcare in, a, in similar terms. You know, there's these corporate hospital corporations buy up all the hospitals, they set the hospital prices, they, um, you know, they bilk the government uh, Medicare programs. Um, you know, they're taking up uh, one fifth of GDP. You know, the, the healthcare industry is this major problem in the United States. A um, hundred and uh, you know, fifty years ago, the railroad corporations occupied a similar position. And you know the uh, railroad rates can really determine the health of, of a community that's dependent on access to uh, to 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 to, tra to freight to freight transportation and and much of the United States and in, in the nineteenth century was agricultural and if you were in a town or near a town you know the price that the railroad co corporation charged you to ship your your wheat or your hogs or whatever it is that you were growing um, would determine your would be your income. And so entire communities could be displaced because because of preferential railroad practices, um, uh, and and so in response to this, uh, in throughout the eighteen seventies, um, uh, the you know there were debates in the Congress about what to do about the railroads. Many state governments passed their own state level rate regulations fixing railroad rates, uh, and finally in the eighteen eighties, the Congress, uh, you know, the federal government. Responded by establishing the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was a federal commission, a regulatory agency, that um, set rates for the for the railroad corporations nationally. Uh, and so, you know, the uh, the 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 idea there uh, uh, is usually talked about in terms of public utility um, regulation. You know, the uh, the idea that a, a certain type of industry, water, electricity. Transportation 
holds uh, what was then called a, a natural monopoly, and sometimes this language survives today. But um, you know, uh, uh, something like um, you know, heating, heating gas for a city. You know, it doesn't make sense to have a competitive market there because you're going to end up overbuilding the uh, the infrastructure. You're going to have you know ten different companies running gas lines under the same street. It's it's it doesn't make any sense. Um, so you end up with a, co a, a, a a company that holds a monopoly position. At which point, you know, uh, the city government or the state or something is gonna is gonna step in and and, and start to uh, to regulate it uh, because the public is not gonna accept pri pri privately determined uh, uh, utility rates. So, um, so I mean, that's you still have those state bodies uh, until today, right? I mean, you, well, you still have uh, public utility uh, commissions, right? Yes, yeah, there are many state public utility commissions in the United States. The Interstate Commerce Commission was um, dismantled under the Clinton administration in the 1990s. Uh, um, so there's no Interstate Commerce Commission anymore. But that's, I mean, that's partially unique to, the, to, to what happened in the, in the United States during the Cold War, which was the expansion of the interstate highway system. So for, for much of the, um, uh, you know, from the 30, beginning in the 30s, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute, but the, beginning in the 30s, the, the jurisdiction of the Interstate Commerce Commission was expanded to include mo motor carriers trucking and um and so the interstate commerce commission not only fixed railroad rates but fixed trucking rates for 50 years um uh part of the uh reaction to the inflation of, of the 70s in the united states was the idea that such kinds of rate regulation um exacerbated inflation they made inflation worse because they fixed rates they didn't allow comp comp competitors to come in and compete down prices offering service you know cheap more uh, cheap more cheaply priced services um, and so you know so so then the interstate commerce commission became you know became a kind of symbol of 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 this diag of this diagnosis so that you know the, the, there was a um, the the state was protecting these un un uncompetitive firms and and uh, making inflation worse and and anyway so so the the Motor carriers were deregulated in in, in, in in the late in 1980, really the end of the Carter administration, and then uh, and then finally in the 90s, the just the entire um, ICE, the Interstate Commerce Commission itself was was abolished. Um, but um, but uh, but you know that's I think that's kind of unique to to, to our transportation uh, infrastructure here in the United States. Um, but ju just to get back to the question of price control itself, you know, so the public utility idea um, is, uh, there's no reason to apply it only to something like railroads. And, um, and, and after the onset of the Great Depression, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the depth and the duration of the unemployment crisis um, prompted uh, the Congress and, and intellectuals and, and, and leading politicians uh, in, um, in the early 30s to really em embrace the idea of national planning. So, the, so, so the, the New Deal in the United States actually begins with a national price control experiment. <laughs> the, 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 one of the first things the Franklin Roosevelt administration does is uh, uh, request a law, the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, that it gets from the Congress, which authorizes it to um, license um, uh, firms for, uh, uh, for um, the uh, imposition of what they called codes of fair competition. So the, so the first, really the first two years of, of the New Deal are an experiment um, in uh, in price fixing, and they they you know the Roosevelt administration administration set up over five hundred. It was like five hundred and fifty code authorities, each for an industry, and they, you know it was it, it was minute. It, it, it was everything from automobiles, a, you know, a huge industry, to um, brazier wire, you know, like the metal wire that would go into women's under underwear. Uh, there was a code authority for that, and it would be a board um, comprised of members of the industry, members of the public, you know, government officials, and um, and then most controversially, members of 
labor. So every industry suddenly now had a code authority where workers could um, uh, elect representatives of their own choosing. Uh, and, you know, uh, so, uh, but, but then the, the powers of the code authority were to set prices, set quantities, set wages, fixed. It, it was a form of legalizing cartel behavior under the idea that this was uh, necessary to stabilize um, industry, to restore business confidence. That was a, v a very prominent argument is that it, uh, investors would not provide capital to these industries unless they knew that they were going to remain profitable and you could guarantee profits through cartel behavior. And, and, and that was the experiment that is, uh, you know, was the National Recovery Administration, the NRA. Um, Today, you try to teach this to, to, to students and, and everybody thinks you're talking about the gun lobby because the National Rifle Administration is, you know, the NRA. But, the, you know, in, in the New Deal, the NRA was a price control experiment. Um, and uh, uh, it was declared unconstitutional in 1935. Um, but this is uh, only six years before the return of, pr of price control with the onset of, of, of World War II. So even even before war, you know, the, the, there was, a, you know, in the United States, a, a thoroughgoing uh, engagement with the idea of, of having prices determined some, by, by, by forces other than just the private corporations themselves. Um, and similarly, in, in France, under the, under the Bloom government, um, uh, uh, I think in 1936 it was, they, they, the, the French established a price control law, which remained on the books until... Uh, uh, Mitterrand in, in 1983. You know the, the, the entire duration of what we think of as the as the 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 uh, you know the 30 glorious years in, in hmm. France occurred in an era with price control. And economists often look back on this and they say, how could it be that the French had maximum employment and price stability? What was happening? And no one recognizes the fact that prices were controlled. The the the, the finance ministry in France had an office. Um, uh, uh, a general commission on price, a price commission, um, which had the authority to intervene in pricing if it if it considered, um, you know, uh, any uh, firm or industry to be to be engaging in, in sort of profit sharing behavior. It could move in and declare a ceiling. It wouldn't have to go back to the um, to the to the parliament and to ask for authority. You know that that authority remained on the books. In the United States, it wasn't like this. After World War II, there's a, there was a huge lobbying campaign by um, um, organized uh, manufacturers to repeal the price control law. Um, and uh, um, uh, they succeeded in 1946. The law expired. The agency that it authorized, where the economist John Kenneth Galbraith had worked, um, uh, the agency uh, was it was defunded. Um, some of its responsibilities were given to the Federal Trade Commission, a, a different agency, um, but it, but it ceased to exist. And then, so when, you know, uh, uh, four years later, when the Korean War begins, this debate has to it plays out differently than it would in other countries because now the Truman administration has to go back to Congress, ask for a new law. There's an entire opportunity for organized interest to try and influence the Congress to shape the law. You know, who is, gonna, who is it going to apply to? What industries are going to be exempt? It's an extremely, um, uh, um, you know, uh, highly pressurized because if, if you hear that the Congress is about to pass a law that is going to uh, empower the, the government to control incomes, you want to make sure that your income gets favorable treatment. It's, very, it's, it's fairly similar to taxes in the way that, you know, loop, loopholes are written into the income tax code, at least in the United States. Um, and so uh, during the Korean War, with, there, there was price control. The Truman administration succeeded in, in getting the authority. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, experience, however, was, was much less consensual than it was during World, World War II. And, uh, and those authorities expired in the early years of the Eisenhower administration. And there hasn't, well, there hasn't been a similar, um, a similarly expansive and thoroughgoing effort at price control since the Korean War. Um, but as far as the history of inflation goes, there is, there is one third um, uh, occasion, uh, which is the Nixon administration. So um, uh, in, you know, in the 1960s, the United States 
escalated its its uh, war in South Vietnam. Um, really, the escalation takes place in '65, um, uh, and it is accompanied by an accelerating inflation. You have a, a, a then it was like three percent, and it, it, every, you know journalists were tearing their hair out, saying, "Oh my God, this is such a terrible inflation." It's kind of humorous now to. Um, to, to, to re realize how, how, how slow that inflation was. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in, the in the late 1960s, the Johnson administration finds itself um, co uh, committed to this war in South Vietnam, but also unable to tell the public the nature of its commitments, in part because of the anti-war movement is, is, is increasingly vocal, you know, is putting thousands of people into the streets by, by the end of the of, of the decade, and um, as the inflation begins, you know Johnson is talking to to his both his economic advisors and his um, f friends uh, f that he made throughout his career in the Senate, who are who are you know they sit on the boards of the major industrial corporations, um, uh, you know people like George Brown of Brown and Root, and, uh, they're telling him, um, you know, well, you know. Vietnam is like Korea. It's another war in South Asia. During Korea, we we imposed price controls, um, and Johnson is saying, "Well, you know, we can't impose price controls because that's going to signal that I'm, that we're going to stay in in South Vietnam for the long run, and we we know that we can't do that because because we you know we're we're, we're planning under the assumption that the Vietnam War is going to end in a few years. You know, it, the last U.S. soldiers don't leave South Vietnam until 1975." Ten years later, but but uh, but as this is starting, you know, he recognizes that if if he's going to ask the Congress to shift the 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 legal basis uh, of of you know government regulation to a to a war footing and authorize price controls, impose wartime taxes, that it's going to be a signal to the public that now the United States is 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 starting you know what could be World War Three, and th and that was really and during the Korean War that was really the language people used. They said, oh, this is World War Three. Um, and Johnson didn't want to do that. So um, in 1966, the Democrats lose at the midterms. There are a variety of reasons. Um, most, most historians draw attention to the recent passage of the Civil Rights Act, and they say the 66 midterms is evidence of uh, a, a white working class racial backlash. You know, people are uh, against integration. They vote for, they start voting against the Democrats. And there's truth to that, but I think historians have not given enough attention to the fact that the inflation is getting underway and the Johnson administration has no plan. Very clearly, you know, they're, they're, they're asking for wage restraint. They're going to organized labor and saying you have to keep your wage demands um, uh, to a government guideline at a time when inflation is going above the guideline. So they're, they're telling the organized working class of the country what is our plan to stop inflation? Well, uh, it relies on you, workers, to accept that your income, your re your real incomes, excuse me, your real incomes are going to fall. And of course, that was unpopular. So the Democrats lose in the '66 midterms. In '68, Johnson doesn't even run. Nixon comes in, and throughout this period, the, there's an active debate about about you know how to control inflation. Um, uh, the, gov the Johnson administration had uh, relied on these voluntary guidelines, um, which weren't working. Um, so when Nixon comes in, he says, we're not going to do any kind of guidelines. We're not going to tell private businesses, unions. We're not going to tell unions how to do their business, how to go about bargaining. We're going to let the – it's a free country. It's a free market. We're going to let f freedom you know, determine the outcome. But we're going to impose austerity. We're going to stop government spending. And that, so that's, that's, that's what the Nixon administration does in 1969 when it comes in. And the result is what we today remember as stagflation. Uh, you know, you have a turning wage price spi spiral. You have workers trying to keep up with the rate of inflation. You have firms in a military boom raising prices. You have a government that has signaled that it's not going to control anything. And then you have um, uh, uh, civilian spending cut back dramatically. So all of the great society stuff, all this stuff is pared back. Um, uh, and this, the civilian share, uh, this, you know, the government share of, of, of GDP for, for non-military purposes at the end of the 60s falls. 
So there's a, there's a real austerity that's going on. And, um, and uh, the public doesn't like this either. So in 1970, the midterm, the 1970 midterms, the Republicans lose. The Democrats get these huge majorities um, uh, because it's clear that, that uh, austerity is not a, 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 an acceptable way to fight inflation. So it's in this context that the last experiment in price control happened. The, Richard Nixon, you know, the, the self-proclaimed uh, candidate of business, spent part of his career as a corporate lawyer on Wall Street, um, always talking about, you know, fr uh, uh, you know uh, freedom. Um, he realizes that if he's going to stay in the White House in 1972, that they have to, fig you know, the administration is going to have to figure out some way to um, reduce unemployment, ex ex return to economic growth, and do so in a way that doesn't exacerbate the inflation. And the model for doing this, uh, the, the historical memory for when this has been possible in the United States are period, uh, periods of, of price control and, and periods of war. Um, so uh, uh, the, the Democratic Congress is, is actually where the authorities for this begin. Um, they pass a law uh, in 1970, authorizing um, uh, the government to control prices, they re they 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 do it. They after the midterms, they reauthorize those powers. It's always on like a three month basis, you know. Um, and um, uh, you know, after the 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 Democratic landslide in the 1970s midterms, they reauthorize those powers, and then it becomes clear that you know Nixon does, he's not sure what to do. He um, uh, ba basically, he calls the Democratic Party leadership's bluff and imposes price controls in August of 1971. And that experiment lasts for about 18 months. Um, um, it doesn't include the, the kind of independent bureaucracy that the Korean War and the World War II controls relied on. Each of those was, you know, something like 75 to 90,000 Officials in World War II, this was augmented by about 350,000 volunteers um, at the community level. You know, they would go to the store. If someone was violating the, 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 the price ceiling, they would, you know, the volunteers would report it back to a regional office where the, then the, the government, you know, employees worked. Um, uh, uh, and then they would try, you know, there was an enforcement division. There's all these law. You know, you would get law there's lawyers there. Um, the Nixon controls didn't set up a bureaucracy like this. The Nixon controls relied on the IRS, the tax, the tax agency, and they put a new code um, in the in corporate income tax, which regulated corporate profits. And so, so they repurposed the IRS to do this. Um, um, the jury, I guess, is is out basically on 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 the effect of this, um, in part because the history was so quickly um, cast aside as as a evidence of of failure and incompetence. But the, but but the record does show that prices stabilized in the second half of 1971, and for the duration of the presidential campaign in 1972, inflation was brought under control, and it worked politically. Nixon wins in a landslide in 1972. So. Um, you know, so that's really the last experiment. Um, um, the 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 judgment that it it was a failure is rooted in the year after the election. So in in November of nineteen seventy two, um, the election happens. Nixon wins in a landslide. January of nineteen seventy three comes around, and the administration, Nixon, Treasury Secretary George Shultz, announced to the public. We're going to make the price control program voluntary. There's, there's no longer going to be any kind of compul compulsory you know, uh, 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 oversight to ensure adherence to the price controls. The, the year 1973 is going to be year, a year of decontrol in which the price guidelines are now voluntary. And the result was that during the year of 1973, inflation returned. <laughs> um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 at the end of the year, um, you know, they had gotten it back down to 2% or something. I think in 1973, it goes back up, you know, 5, 6%. And then at the end of the year, um, the Yom Kippur War happens in uh, Israel and Syria and Egypt. 
and um, uh, by December, the first OPEC embargo happens. And so this, this inflation that has been unleashed by the, by the uh, Nixon administration's decision to return controls to a voluntary basis, um, that inflation then accelerates with the oil price shock at the end of the year. So, and then, so in 1974, you know, the, the, there's really a, um, um, uh, what we think of as the sort of the, the, the uh, dreary, um, austere, um, you know, uh, uh, social conflict of, of, the, of the 1970s, you know, the, the, dull, the doldrums of the 70s is really rooted in this 1974 recession, 1974-75, which till that point, it was the deepest, uh, you know, unemployment gets up to like 10%. It's the deepest uh, recession since the Great Depression. Um, and, and for somebody, you know, who is, you know, 45 or something in 1975, they had lived through the depression as a child, you know. So there's a, there's a, there's a memory there about you know the 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 um, weaknesses of um, American capitalism. So uh, 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 just to to give another example, you know, in 1970 mm-hmm. in 1975, Time magazine runs a r- runs a cover that's you know that uh, has a picture of Adam Smith and it says you know is is this the end for capitalism or something you know just like a kind of we, today we think this is ridiculous, but but, uh, but 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 the crisis was real, and 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 you know, journalists and somewhere like Time Magazine would write stories about it. So, so so you know that's the last ex- experiment. There there are various um, forms of industry specific rate regulation relying on s- similar public utility principles, but as far as the kind of in- total encompassing economy wide authority to control prices, it's not it doesn't exist in the United States right now. Um, and but you do still have those local uh, public utility commissions, right? Yes, yeah, states states have public utility commissions that regulate certain utilities like water, gas, electricity. And then the other one that we have a lot in the United States are municipal city government laws fixing maximums for rent, housing rent. Those those the, the major city, New York City, LA, a, a lot major cities have these on the books. And it's a it's a it's a it's an area of political life in the United States that is seeing new 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 energy because uh, housing is is you know underbuilt. There's a homelessness crisis, and so um, local elections in in many cities now are this is an issue in local election elections whether they should establish their own you know new rent control authorities. Mm-hmm. So isn't it kind of ridiculous because uh, a few months ago we had this discussion starting uh, with Isabella Weber's article in The Guardian and everybody was freaking out. But now you're telling us that you do still have demo- democratically controlled prices in the United States and not any prices, but really important prices like the cost of living, energy, etc., cetera, uh, water, public, u- public utility commissions. So why are people not aware of this of the fact that the state is in fact already participating uh, in a very strong way when it comes to setting prices well i mean a big one is oil in the united states you know we have electricity in our homes but the a major energy cost is individual commuting um uh gasoline and um the nixon controls you know the 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 experience of the 1970s was one in which the federal government moved over the oil industry and and fixed the price of of, of petroleum and um and there 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 were shortages gasoline shortages happened um refining capacity the, the amount of raw crude going into refineries in the United States fell during the 1974 recession which is like you know um, it it doesn't happen like it like the increase can slow, but but for actual refi- you know refinery input to to decline is like a clear you know sign that the that the economic activity is 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 declining you know it was a deep recession, um, and you know people who are in controlling positions in America in, in many American institutions today you know they're in their late fifties and they're in their sixties they lived through the seventies. And they've internalized this lesson that, you know, what happened during the 70s is that the government tried to control prices, shortages resulted, uh, everybody got, was worse off, 
and of course we're not going to try this again and they sort of dismiss it out of hand without really studying what happened um you know and so in some ways we're at the mercy right now of this generational cohort <laughs> um uh, um but um, yeah, so but I would say the short w one brief answer is the oil industry. You know, the oil industry in the United States has this tremendous power because everybody drives their cars everywhere. Um, that's starting to change as the oil companies themselves have reimagined themselves as energy companies and they sort of see the writing on the wall about, about climate change and, and decarbonization. Um, so, you know, it's starting to change. Um, but, but, you know, the other part of this is, um, um, sorry, uh, the, the other part of this is uh, the fact that the Congress is going to have to authorize an expansion of any kind of, uh, of, mm. of power like this on the federal level. You know, what, what, what we're talking about, you know, the, the price of, 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 of electricity is a state government. But the, a big industry like oil, you know, it has to be regulated nationally. It relies on the U.S. Congress. And whether the U.S. Congress represents the will of the U.S. people is, is really something in contention right now. <laughs> um, um, the, the jury is out on, on whether or not the Congress represents the, the public. So, um, so that, you know, that's another, that's another problem. But I mean, uh, those discussions, for example, in Europe are getting really serious. I mean, even the European Commission, uh, which really, I mean, you can't say that the European Commission is not business business friendly enough or anything. Huh? That this would be ridiculous. And even they are thinking about cutting gas prices, for example, now. So um, let's say that more and more countries during this crisis that is coming up right now and that the which might be severe, uh, more and more countries are discussing price controls. How would this be possible? Because, I mean, this entire infrastructure, this bureaucratic infrastructure, let's say uh, that the United States said in the 40s and 50s, doesn't really exist anymore, right? Or in, in Europe, I mean, in Europe, for example, you said that into the 1980s in France, you had price controls. But what about this infrastructure? Would this be possible to just reimpose price controls easily? I mean, I mean, there are also some advantages, right? Because, for example, nowadays we are living in the digital age. Maybe it might be easier to monitor prices, etc. So, I mean, I see some problems, like you don't have the old infrastructure anymore, but at the same time, some opportunities that we didn't have, let's say, 70, 80 years back. I, I wouldn't say that the um, problem of bureaucratic capacity or institutional capacity, um, meaning, you know, uh, 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 the size of, of the bureaucracy is really a, a problem or ever was. It's true. You, it, might, it might take fewer people now because we can monitor prices in a, in a, in a more efficient way. We don't need uh, entire offices of people, you know, doing paperwork. Um, um, To just to track an industry, uh, that's true. But I don't think that was ever really a, a barrier. The barrier is always political. There's somebody who who has it. There, I mean, there there are, you know, people who control industries. There there are the stockholders of that industry. There are senior managers whose incomes rely on the health of that industry, and those people have political influence. So what's happening? You know, I'm 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 not. Um, an, an expert on European politics, um, uh, and I, I wouldn't know, you know, whether the um, Commission or the national governments, uh, you know, I wouldn't know how they would divide or share responsibility for something like a, like a return to a, to you know, price regulation. Um, but I can say that the fact that people are talking openly about it signals to me a change in the attitude of the people who control the industry. So the energy companies themselves, the energy, energy companies themselves are realizing, you know, that they, you know, maybe, maybe it's not the end of the world if, if their control of uh, access to natural gas, to petroleum products, um, is something they have to share with, with government. You know, um, um, may, maybe, or, or, or may, maybe it is that, you know, uh, among the other industries, there, there's a recognition that, you know, um, this, 
this is a real, you know, this energy, this coming energy shock or this current energy shock we're in is, is a real problem and that, you know, what is usually or what has been for much of the second half of the 20th century, a kind of united front of business against public, you know, intervention, um, maybe this united front can start to break up a little bit and, and the oil interests, you know, maybe we, we can uh, uh, realign against them in some way. But what, I, what I'm saying is that at root, it's a political problem. It's, it's about which organized interests are going to um, uh, acquiesce in having their incomes controlled, which configuration of organized interests are going to Im impose that control of incomes, and, uh, and, and uh, what is the resulting distribution of income going to be. Because if Europe were, were, were to uh, 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 not control prices and allow um, the industry to suddenly start making, you know, uh, hundred fifty percent returns on investment, or, or something like that, and um, the price of energy for for people across Europe were to go up, that would be a redistribution of income. You know, from from the from the public, the broad public, mm. every you know everyone that uses energy to the energy companies, uh, um, and so you know maybe another way to look at what's going on is 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 people in controlling positions and in, in, in business and, and the government realizing that that kind of redistribution is politically unacceptable and one last question are you hopeful that maybe this entire discussion about price controls might also unleash a broader discussion about democratic planning once again like in the 1930s <sighs> yes <laughs> You know, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, broke through a logjam on government spending, which now the, the war in Ukraine for, I guess, you know, um, unfortunate reasons has continued. You know, gov go government spending is back on the table in a way that it, it seemed impossible, you know, just five years ago. And uh, once, you know, that door is open, there's a lot of questions that, become possible. So, yeah, so I, I, I am uh, interested to see uh, how, you know, um, we will uh, respond. <laughs> um, and uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, to continuing to, to talk about it with, with people like you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, to all our listeners, anybody who wants to keep track of what Andrew's doing, you can follow him on Twitter, Andrew Elrod and see what he's writing, what he's publishing, where he's, uh, with whom he's talking, etc. Apart from that, of course, we also thank our listeners for listening to us, and we are always very glad if they uh, support us financially. And, of course, thank you for being here with us today, Andrew. Thank you. Das war Wohlstand für alle. Ihr könnt uns finanziell unterstützen über paypal.me-ole und Wolfgang oder über die in der Beschreibung angegebene Bankverbindung. Herzlichen Dank!